Hi all, today on LawCaseUK.com I'm going to be analysing the 1999 House of Lords case of the Crown against Woolen. I'm doing so because I received a request to do so from one of our subscribers, Tabeta. Apologies Tabeta, it's taken me so long to get round to meeting your request. I hope it's not so late that the video is of no use to you. Um, but if it is, my apologies, but it is useful for me to see the type of cases that um, students might um, want analysing so even though it's taken me a little while to get round to it I've decided to analyse Woolen in case there's a, an appetite out there for uh, a video such as this. So looking at the case of Woolen it's a criminal case and it's a criminal case that concerns mens rea that is the mental element of crime and in particular it, it relates to that part of mens rea that can be satisfied by a proof of an intention on the part of an accused. Now, as you will probably already know, intention is the most serious standard of mens rea, and it can be satisfied in one of two ways. Either, and most commonly, by proof of a direct intention to cause something to come about, or, more unusually, by an oblique intention to bring about what will be the actus reus of the crime. Now, the case of Woolen is a case that explains the second, less common variant of these, that of oblique intention. Now, the way I'm going to analyse this case is to ask, what is the problem that the criminal law, criminal law is facing in cases of oblique intention? And I'm going to look at that in relation to Woolen and ha ask, how does Woolen resolve that problem? But before I do so, let me add some context, um, and in particular I begin by saying that the most obvious example of a crime requiring intention as a mens rea is that of murder. And most often, the mens rea requirement is met by the more common variant, that of direct intention. So, for example, if I deliberately shoot someone, intending to cause their death, then I have obviously met the mens rea of attention, intention, and it's a direct intent on my part. I brought about the unlawful act, i.e. the unlawful killing, because quite simply that was my aim, it was my purpose to do so, it was what I wanted to happen. Now, we know that motive is not an element of a criminal offence, but this is when motive can help to provide a jury with evidence that might give them an idea of what my intention is in a particular case if, as an accused, I choose not to confess or admit what my intention might have been. Now, in cases where an accused doesn't tell us what their um, actual intention is, there can be situations in criminal offences where there is insufficient evidence to prove that I actually intended the consequence because it's what I wanted to happen. But in these cases, it can be shown that I foresaw that there was a risk that my, co my conduct might bring about the consequence. Now, what I've described there, you may recognise as the mens rea of recklessness. And as you will know, in many serious cases, for example, criminal damage, assault, section 20 wounding, section 20 inflicting GBH, the offence can be committed either intentionally or recklessly. So in those cases, the law has provided a backup, if you like, if the mens rea of intention can't be proved, but there is an element of foresight present on the part of the defendant. The defendant does not is, um, get away. Um, Scott free on the basis that they didn't intend the action. Now, in some offences such as murder, the actus reus cannot be committed recklessly. It can only be committed intentionally. Recklessness is quite simply not an option. So, evidentially, everything, everything is fine if there is evidence of the defendant's aim or their purpose, and in many cases there will be. But what happens if a person has committed an act that has an obvious consequence, but maintains that even though it was foreseeable, 
it was not their intention to bring it about. And also that there seems some validity in that contention that they make. It just might be possible. And the example that's commonly given in the textbooks and in some of the cases that look at oblique intention is that of a person that detonates a bomb on a passenger aircraft intending to destroy items that they have placed in the hold, items that are insured for a large sum of money, and items that they wish to destroy merely to recover the insurance money. They recognise that by detonating the bomb, it is likely that the plane, as well as the items, will be destroyed. They recognise that it's likely that if the plane is destroyed, the passengers will also be killed. But they're actually ambivalent as to whether they are or not. They would be happy for them to survive, providing that the, the goods are destroyed in the explosion. So in such cases, however unlikely the scenario might actually be, there can be said to be no direct intention. The purpose is not to kill people, it is to damage those goods or destroy those goods. Now, the question here, of course, becomes whether this mens rea of intention can be satisfied if a person brings about such a consequence, knowing that it could happen, but their actual direct intention or purpose is to bring about something else. So that is that second variant of intention, that of in oblique intention. Now clearly the difficulty that the criminal law is facing is that that person that's detonated the bomb cannot be allowed to get away scot-free, but nor can they be allowed to get away with something less than being labelled for killing those people and deliberately killing those people. So how does the law deal with that? And how does the law deal with it at the same time as being fair to the defendant and not, in effect, convicting them of murder when the mens rea is actually quite simply just recklessness, when we know that recklessness is not good enough um, to, to result in a conviction for murder. So what the courts have decided, and long decided, that it is possible to convict in these cases, and, and there has been a string of cases that look at the degree of foresight that is necessary to substantiate this oblique attention. Now, obviously, it has to be more demanding than simple foresight. Otherwise, that would be to reduce intention to recklessness in cases where recklessness is not an appropriate mens rea. And this is where the case of Woolen comes in, because it settles the degree of appreciation, this degree of foresight that is actually required in such cases. It is, in effect, identifying a level of foresight of consequences, consequence that is above simple recklessness, but of such a standard that it can be said that the more serious mens rea of intention has indeed been satisfied. So, perhaps a little long-windedly, that sets out the, the context for Woolen and the problem that it's grappling with. If we have a look at the facts of Woolen, the facts are quite simple, and I'm quoting from the judgment. The appellant lost his temper and threw his three-month-old son onto a hard surface. His son sustained a fractured skull and died. The appellant was charged with murder. The Crown did not contend that the appellant desired to kill his son or to cause him serious injury. So the Crown did not contend that he had a direct intention to kill or cause GBH. The issue in the case was whether the appellant nevertheless had this intention to cause serious harm. And the only way to satisfy that would be to find oblique intention. Now, the appellant denied that he had any such intention. And so you can see there that importantly in the case, the Crown here is not alleging that he had an actual intention to kill or cause grievous bodily harm. And perhaps I should just reinforce the fact that um, in terms of um, the mens rea of murder, it is sufficient not just to intend to kill, but also if one's objective 
is to cause grievous bodily harm, then that uh, intention will be sufficient. So here, what the court is faced with in Woolen is whether there is a bleak intention, not to kill, but to cause serious injury or grievous bodily harm. Um, and at the trial, the judge there at first instance directed the jury that they could convict on a, an oblique attention basis if they were satisfied that the accused appreciated when he threw the child that there was a substantial risk that he would cause serious injury to it. So the key phrase there becomes that of substantial risk. And what the appeal courts had to do was consider that phrase against an earlier phrase that had been used by the Court of Appeal in an oblique intention case, and that is the case of Nedrick. And that case had used the phrase not of substantial risk, but that of virtual certainty. Now, it was accepted on the appeal by the Crown in the case of Woolen that a substantial risk test would be wider than virtual certainty. That is, it would set a lower standard of to be met um, before the accused could be considered to have an oblique intention. But they contended that either Nedrick was wrong or that it didn't apply in this particular case. But they accepted that what the judge had said at first instance had set um, a, a lower standard than the Court of Appeal had in the Nedrick case when it used the phrase virtual certainty. So in the Woolen case on the appeal, the certified question for the House of Lords, or the relevant part, I think, of the certified question is this. In murder, while there is no direct evidence that the purpose of a defendant was to kill or to inflict serious injury on the victim, that is no direct intent. Is it necessary to direct the jury that they may only infer an intent to do serious injury if they are satisfied, A, that serious bodily harm was a virtual certain consequence of the defendant's voluntary act, and you can see they're applying the phrase from Nedrick there, and B, that the defendant appreciated that fact. Now, in deciding the answer to that certified question, the court reviewed a series of cases um, that, had that had discussed the degree of probability required, the degree of foresight on the part of the defendant in such a case. Now, I don't propose to go through that long series of cases that the court goes through, but suffice to say, it might be necessary for you to do so if you were to answer an essay on the history of the evolution of the concept of oblique intention. But if you do have to do that, in each case, just ask yourself, what was the test that was used? And is it wider or narrower on each occasion? And in, in the present case we're looking at, we, we're looking at somewhere where the trial judge has used a wider test than the Nedrick test that had previously been put forward by the Court of Appeal. And in Woolen, of course, the key question they're answering is whether this Nedrick test is the test to be applied in such cases. So for our current purposes, and in, to enable me to deal with this case as succinctly as I can, it suffice to say that the House of Lords did support the Nedrick direction, um, and they, they adopted the test of virtual certainty. And because of that, the House of Lords concluded that the trial judge had misdirected the jury when he used the phrase substantial risk in place of the phrase virtual certainty. And co consequently, the conviction for murder was um, not a valid one, and the House of Lords substituted a conviction for manslaughter. So the crux of this case of Woolen is the is that the question for a jury when considering whether an accused has an oblique intention is whether the unlawful consequence was a virtual certainty. That's the first part of the test. And the second one is whether the accused foresaw it as a virtual certainty. Because we know that when we're dealing with intention, it's the 
subjective view of the defendant that is important. Now, if those two parts of the test are met, it would be open to a jury to find that intention was present on an oblique basis. But nothing less than this virtual certainty and the knowledge of that virtual certainty in the mind of the defendant will do. Any lesser degree of foresight, and you're likely to be looking at a verdict of manslaughter rather than one of murder. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.